This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 418, recorded on December 2nd, 2016. This episode is brought to you by CuriosityStream, a subscription streaming service that offers over 1,500 documentaries and nonfiction series from the world's best filmmakers. Get unlimited access starting at just $2.99 a month. And for our audience, the first two months are completely free if you sign up at curiositystream.com slash microbe and use the promo code microbe. The show is sponsored by Drobo, a family of safe, expandable, yet simple-to-use storage arrays. Drobos are designed to protect your important data forever. Uh, this holiday season, give someone a Drobo to keep all their files and memories safe forever. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me here today in New York City, Dixon de Pommier. Hello, Vincent. I understand you have to leave now, though. <laughs> not not quite yet. I have to leave in a couple of minutes, but not right not right away. Look at those clouds, Dixon. Yeah, they're pretty. So it's three twelve. Yeah, it's kind of getting a little dark, right? It is. And we have clouds. We have some really dark clouds with a little blue peeking through. Ten degrees Celsius, fifty percent humidity. Yeah, I was just in uh, Florida. It was eighty degrees. In the day, yeah. exactly eighty degrees. Yep. Well, at some part of the day. Also joining us from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. I figured I'd bring you in early because last time we left you out for the whole episode. No, you didn't. Not not quite the whole episode. You were chomping at the bit. Yes, chomp, chomp. You probably have the same weather, right? Pretty much. We had a little peak of sun today and then it got cloudy again. And then we're actually supposed to get real sunny weather this weekend, I think, which will be a nice change. Also joining us from Austin, Texas, Rich Condit. Howdy, everybody. How you doing? You have always said howdy, haven't you? Uh, I guess so. It's not, it's not a Texas yes, that's thing, right? right? Now it's appropriate. Texas thing. That's correct. <laughs> it just be maybe it was some sort of weird foreshadowing or something. Uh, we have sixty-one degrees in rain. It's really, you know, well, that's what it is. That's sixteen Celsius, by the way. Texas could so, use that rain, by the way. Oh, uh, Texas can always use rain, and they're right. forecasting. Yes. Ordinarily, December is like two inches, and they're forecasting three for this weekend. Look at that. So, hmm. When it rains, it pours. <laughs> also joining us from southeastern Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi, everybody. So it's 40 degrees here, feels like 30, or vice versa. I already flipped off of the page because you keep talking about how dark it is, and you, we have a half hour more of sunlight than you do. <laughs> Why, was that because of where you are? We're further west, and yes. I think maybe maybe more north than New York City. But, yeah, it's yeah. one of the things I do not like in the winter when it gets dark. I go, I leave the building and it's dark. Yes. That that I don't like it at all. It's true. Yeah, it's sun's going down at like four thirty now or early. Yeah, four thirty. So. It said for New York. Okay. We have a couple of follow ups. We have a letter from Chaim or Chaim. Who who responded to uh, my request to to know what's on your iPod or your what podcast you listen to? Hi Twiv. In addition to the Twiv and Twivo podcasts, I listen to Nature News, Signal, You Are Not So Smart, Futility Closet, This American Life, The West Wing Weekly, Escape Pod, and Relic radio science fiction in addition to a couple of Jewish religious educational podcasts. I use Patreon to support Twix, uh, You Are Not So Smart, and Futility Closet, as well as some non-podcast projects. I would love if more content creators use this platform, as I'm happy to pay for the value I receive. Thanks, as always, for a great podcast. Cool. Thank you. Nice. Some of these sound interesting. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Like right. you are not fu- so smart. <laughs> futility closet. <laughs> I wonder yeah, what that's. Futility about. closet. It's <laughs> a good name for a podcast. And I, I can tell you what Dixon listens to. None. Yeah, go on. <clears throat> he doesn't listen to any podcast. No, I sit and think. 
There's another way you can put that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah Vincent's got, uh, I'm sorry, Dixon's got a podcast going on in his head all the time. I do, I do. He's got his own podcast. I think that's yeah. the idea. That, that is the idea. Uh, don't get me started with Dixon. <laughs> Jeffrey writes, Dear Twivsters, so long as the discussion has fallen onto second person pronouns and grammar podcasts, I'd like to enter a quick plug for Slate's Lexicon Valley. A recent episode from November 1 has a discussion on the on the rich ecology of thines and thous. Oh, on how the rich ecology of thines and thous was pared down to you. Incidentally, I don't know how much crosstalk there might be between departments. But the podcast is being hosted right now by John McHorter, who teaches linguistics mm. at Columbia. Dixon, how much crosstalk is there here? None. <laughs> In our department? <laughs> well, if it's between a linguistics and a science department, I zero. Don't so. I don't think You'd think so. the linguists would talk to everybody. <laughs> they should. Arg. The name of this podcast is Whither Didst Thou Go? Best. Uh, John McHorter, what is it? Does he do it all the time, or just? And why is Slate sponsoring him and not me? Come on! I've listened to Lexicon Valley. I almost mentioned it last week when I mentioned my podcast, but I've kind of fallen off. They seem to, I don't know, a little bit snarky on some of the ones I listen to, yeah, or something. Yeah. I just, yeah. Th this is uh, this particular one is episode ninety-seven. Hmm. Well, I guess he sold his soul to Slate. Good for him. <laughs> yeah. There you go. He was sold into slatery. Oh! <laughs> and so he can... Oh, no, no. Jeffrey is not continuing. Oh, I want to tell you about ASV. It's not too early to start planning to go to the American Society for Virology annual meeting. It's happening in Madison, Wisconsin, June 24th to 28th, 2017. It will be held at the lovely Monona Terrace Convention Center, which was designed by the American architect, Frank... Lloyd Wright. Oh. All the symposia and workshops will be held in this single building with beautiful views of Lake Monona. Abstracts are due February 1st, 2017. In the meantime, if you want to apply for a travel grant, that is students and postdocs only, or if you'll sponsor an abstract, which is required for all submitted abstracts, then now is a good time to start working on obtaining or renewing your ASV membership before February 1st. Details available at asv.org. You can also find the ASC program there, and there's a link to the meeting site. And I just today I registered for the meeting because uh, it, it it opened up sometime in November, so it's a good time to register. You get a, a cheaper rate if you go before a certain date. So when you hear this, pull over to the side of the road, whip out that iPhone or Android hey. device, and go to asv.org and follow the registration link to the Madison site. What if you reg Mo register before an uncertain date? <laughs> <laughs> then you'll be in a Get black an hole. Uncertain rate. Mm. <laughs> yes, Kathy. Most, mostly, what I wanted to emphasize is that uh, this membership thing—if you leave it to the last minute when you're also working on submitting your abstract—it could just add stress. So, if you know you're going to go to the meeting and you want to apply for a travel grant, or if you're a PI, or if you need your PI to sponsor you, then you can work on your membership things now while you're still mulling over what you're going to put in your abstract. Stress. You mean you mean actually be responsible and do things in a timely manner? <laughs> Stress. Yes. Trying to have people not procrastinate. Yep. Yes. Do, does, every, Do does, that, does everybody have stress? Or is it just a fraction of the population? I'm everybody has stress of some kind. Some kind. Dix, do you get uh, stressed? Sure, absolutely. By me, I, mostly. I, right? I, nah, I you don't. You, no, that's actually not true. You, you yeah, don't stress you, you me don't at all. You don't want to admit it. You don't want to. Admit you don't stress it. me yeah. at all, Vincent, because I know you, that you don't mean it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I think there's some age at, before which you don't have stress. I mean, neonates, you right. know, and so, so forth. There's an age after which you don't, and it's called dead. Well, yeah. or Alzheimer's <laughs> or something. Well, yeah. and you always have. There's always physiological stress. That's true. What What would that be? Oh, well, you're hungry, you're tired, you're, you know, right, right. Mm -hmm. there, there are stresses. That's true. Physiological stress. Yeah. Hmm. The stress I was experiencing this morning driving down from uh, Providence was to make sure that I got off at the right exits. 
Really? That was yeah. stressful? You that, don't, you know, I bet you don't even know how to use your GPS on your phone, right? <laughs> of course I do. Um, and, but I took the Merritt Parkway home, and it was a lovely drive. It was absolutely beautiful. Nice. Oh, that is that is a pretty road as long as nobody has any kind of a an issue that clogs it up. Uh, right. Well, they were mowing the lawn, believe it or not, on December 2nd, mowing the lawn. Can uh, you imagine? Uh, the lawn is still green. That's also what's wrong. <laughs> but yes. uh, actually, it was it was a very pleasant stress-free drive once I got onto the Merritt Parkway. Good. We have a paper for you this week. This came out in Nature Microbiology, and it's entitled, A Mouse Model for MERS Coronavirus Induced Acute Respiratory Distress Syndrome by Cockrell, Yount, Scobie, Jensen, Douglas, Bial, Tang, Marasco, Heisey, and Barrick. This is from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and also Harvard Medical School. Some of these individuals, Mark and Ralph, were on the the podcast, the TWIV that I did there a couple of months ago. Right. And uh, this is, someone last time said, how about some more MERS? So here you go. you got more MERS coming today. This is all about making a mouse model to study Middle East Respiratory Syndrome coronavirus, which, just to remind everyone, emerged in 2012, causes acute respiratory distress, pneumonia-like symptoms, and multi-organ failure. Case fatality rate is 36%. And um, most of the serious illnesses in people with other health issues, the number of people do get infected without having serious disease. Uh, but the purpose here is to make an an, a small animal model. There there have been some papers already published on mouse and non-human primate models. Have we talked about some of those before or I maybe think, only in passing? Or Yeah, the mouse one we did very early on, a transgenic mouse was made. So the receptor for the virus is DPP4, dipeptidyl peptidase 4. We talked about the identification of that receptor a while ago, because it happened very quickly after uh, the isolation of the virus. We talked about the production of a transgenic mouse model where they put the human DPP4 gene into mice as a transgene. And the interesting point about that mouse model, those mice get infected, but they get brain infections, which isn't right. right. And because probably you're overproducing this protein in many tissues, and, and, and that uh, particular protein is a, a regulates a number of immune functions. Okay, so right. if that's you right. overexpress the protein, you might uh, create wonkiness in the immune system. Of course, you can't overexpress the protein; you'd have to overproduce it. Okay, and then right. you would get Thanks. wonky immune dis- dysregulation. Yeah. Thank right. you, Jane. Jane yes. Flint, <laughs> who who clearly did not edit this paper. Oh no, not at all. So Jane should have a podcast of her own on. Whatever, bo- <laughs> whatever bothers her. <laughs> Could be lots of things. What a great podcast. Whatever bothers me. That's a, it is a great name. <laughs> whatever, whatever bothers me with Jane Flint. Maybe or you could call it Anna. Boy, I could think of about a thousand episodes. <laughs> <laughs> now, 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 now. I like Jane very much. She's very, well, I'm very. I'm not talking about Jane. I'm just talking about I get a lot of stuff that bothers me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, people like those kinds of podcasts. So, if you just this is an interesting little thing to talk about here. If you just put a receptor gene into mice as a transgene, you overproduce. You don't always get the right. Uh, production in, in the right tissues. And so the disease you get is may not be close enough to what is happening in, in humans. And so that's the whole point of this paper here is to make a better model. So the mouse well, it's, model... It's actually, it's actually two issues. You, <clears throat> by overproducing that receptor, you get infection potentially in cell types that normally wouldn't get it. Right. And then you may also be mucking up the physiological normal state of the of the animal by putting this the strange receptor in and, That's and right. uh, overproducing it. Right. Now, uh, I, I must say, let me just take a moment and talk about our work years ago. So many, many years ago, we made a transgenic mouse model for polio infection by taking the human poliovirus receptor and make it transgenic in mice. Now, there is no ortholog of the polio receptor in mice, anything that anything is close to it. Right. Whereas for DPP-4, there is a mouse ortholog that's quite close. So what we did is we took the human gene with its control elements, and when you put that into the mouse, 
the expression of the mRNA is very similar to that in humans because you're putting the right control sequences. So that's another way to do it, but nobody makes genomic clone transgenic mice any, anymore, so it's kind of gone, by the way. So here they're trying to get around that. And the cool thing about this paper, I, which I think is the technology that they use, right? So they basically correct mouse DPP4 so that it can act as a functional virus receptor, and they use CRISPR-Cas9. We'll talk about that a little bit. Now, Correcting it, meaning turning it into the human form. Yeah, they, just keep, you, you, they don't correct it, because as far yeah. as mice are concerned, they're quite right. It was right. fine. <laughs> <laughs> they're quite right. Yes, right. They basically insert codons to match the human sequence at two positions in the mouse gene. That's all you need to do is change two positions in the mouse gene. Now, I just want to point out a little grammar thing here before we get going. They write in the introduction, this strategy resulted in a mouse that is permissive for MERS coronavirus infection. And I would say that that is not the right word, permissive, because the mice are already permissive. They're, permissive means if you put viral genome in a cell, it will replicate. Now, that's according to our textbook, of course. So you, you may have a different definition. I don't care what your definition is. Because it's wrong. <laughs> no, I didn't, didn't say that. I didn't say <laughs> that. So, okay, yeah. Who wrote the textbook? So what do you right? say? Susceptible? <laughs> so here resulted in a mouse that is susceptible to infection. Right. They're already permissive. Now, the reason I point this out is because later they're going to use the susceptible word. Uh-oh. So they're not even sure what word to use, so they used the two of them. But all they had to do was read principles of virology very early on. We, dis- <laughs> we uh, defined this. I could have a podcast about things that bother me. Clearly. You do have a podcast about it. We're, we're on derivative. it right now. <laughs> I, I don't think people. I don't think probably people. be derivative of Jane Flint's podcast. Yeah, that's right. I would like to do that one with Jane. That would be fun. Just so, sitting there and goading uh, her on. Yes, I have a post-it note flag for permissive susceptible. Page yeah. thirty-one, volume one of the fourth edition. Oh, thank you. They're bold. Thank you very much. <laughs> now, as I said before, these are human definitions, right? But when you write a book, you have to be consistent. So that's the way we defined it. But people use it in a flippy, floppy way all the time. and you know, Most people probably never think about it. No, most people don't. They don't think about expressing proteins or any such thing. What about thing. the reviewer of the paper, though? Shouldn't they have picked that up? No, because most people don't think about you know, being accurate in grammar. Well, and from the perspective of a, of a paper, you know, it's, it's presenting the data. It's the primary research. And... As long as it's clear from the context what you mean, you could get away with sliding a little bit or having differences from one paper to another in some degree. But um, yes, clearly, if you want to systematize this and put it in a textbook, you would like to be very consistent throughout because otherwise people, students especially, are going to read the book and get confused. Right. Well, yeah. I- if you use uh, susceptible and permissive alternatively throughout the book and meant different things at different times, that would be crummy, right? Yes. So you can see, yeah, this but paper in, in alone... A, in a use, paper, I think there's a, little more, there's a little more leeway for that sort of but thing. But they do use two different words to describe the same thing in this paper. In the beginning, yes. they use permissive. In the end, they use susceptible. So I would argue that this is the editor's job to fix, but they don't because they don't care about <laughs> editing it properly. So, so <laughs> mice the, with well, the wrong have, receptor are still the, the permissive. Editors, is that the what editors you're saying? Have, the other the editors have bigger fish to fry. I mean, they need to they need to make sure that data are are looking appropriate and that that things match up. The you know the data support the results and that um, and nothing looks like it might be um, manipulated. I mean, there's there's a lot going on in the journal world these days that you need to be vigilant about. Yeah, and I think maybe this is this is something that fell through the cracks. Were you going to say something, Kathy? Yeah. Uh- so in the abstract is where they have susceptible, but then you're saying in the introduction they have permissive or, or so, uh, resistant or – yeah, in, uh, it doesn't matter. And, and also in the discussion they have susceptible. I'll get to that. Don't worry. Okay. I probably should leave today because I'm just very picky today, as Dixon <laughs> said. Goodbye. Yes. You guys handle the rest of it. <laughs> All right. So uh, the date. <laughs> now, it's, it was previously shown that you just have to change two amino acids in murine DPP4. And that will, in cell culture, allow virus binding entry and replication. And so they use CRISPR-Cas9 to introduce those two changes into the mouse. And this is really cool technology to do this. (laughs) They basically 
have, will are going to take um, mouse uh, embryos and inject them with the 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 uh, RNAs that you need to do this. I'll tell you how to do it in a moment. And they're going to put those back in the mother, and they're going to develop. And the, the 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 mice that are born are going to be screened for the correct alleles. Right. They do this. They do this with zygotes. So we're talking zygotes, fertilized egg, single right. cell stage. So you get everything. You know, you get the whole animal right. Right. with one shot because you only got one cell. Uh, uh, the, what they, I don't think they said, or I didn't, I wasn't looking too hard for it, is whether those those zygotes are generated in vitro or whether they're from yeah, pseudo impregnated mouse. Yeah, yeah right. I don't know. They could take them out of. Probably they take them out, but probably I mean, that, easier to do. In that's what we used to do for transgenics, but I don't know how it's changed. Okay, at so any rate, they, so that what they do, what you have to do is you have to to clip out the the two amino acids. So it's a stretch of DNA with these two amino acids between it's it's amino acids two eighty eight and three thirty. You have to introduce guide RNAs, and then the nuclease Cas nine will unwind the DNA and cleave both strands according to where these guide RNAs are, are hybridizing on the DNA, all right? So they actually introduce Cas9 RNA and guide RNAs into the, um, the zygotes, the embryos, as, as Rich said. Now, this is a little different than normal because you, you, sometimes you put DNAs in, but in this case they're putting RNAs in, so they don't have to worry about the guide RNAs being processed and so forth. So the guide RNAs are going to tell Cas9, which is a nuclease, to cut out the sequence with the wrong amino acids for, uh, for, for the virus to bind to. Then they've also introduced the same time into these embryos um, oligonucleotides that have the altered DPP4 sequence. And these are going to allow, or they're going to direct homologous recombination repair of the cleave DNA. So instead of allowing you know, the mouse DNA to repair it, or non-homologous, non-homologous recombination to repair it, which would disrupt the gene, you're putting in sequences that will allow correct repair, and that's how, excuse me, that's how you get the, the mm-hmm. two new amino acids put in. It's very cool. Now, those oligonucleotides, those are, those are DNA oligonucleotides, correct? Uh, let's see. I mean, let me I go think to so. Place. They don't, they, I don't, yeah, I they think don't they specify are DNA. them. I went up, you know, I, uh, I actually, because even though I'm, relatively familiar with yeah, this. Oligos, I went and looked yeah. up a video again, okay, and found a video that I said, wow, I got to make this a pick. It turns out I picked it about 100 episodes ago. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but I think it, I think it is actually either a single or it would be make most sense with a double stranded, I think, oligonucleotide. Oligodeoxyribonucleotide. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah, they call them oligonucleotides and then they say the other stuff is RNA, you know, Cas9 yeah. RNA, guide RNA, Right. And these are oligonucleotides. Yeah. Right. You'd want the you'd want the oligos to be DNA because you want them to recombine with DNA. Yeah. And, that's right. And these things are, um, like fifty, uh, forty or fifty amino acids apart. So we must be talking about two different guide RNAs. Mm-hmm. We're not excising the whole sequence. That's We're right. talking about targeting right. two alleles separately. Separately, and you can do that at the same time. Right, the, you know, back t- at you know, back in, in the transgenic age, you know, you had to do stem cells, and uh, you know, inject those into embryos and hope for the best. This is just right into the zygote, yep. and it all just happens right there, no problem. Yeah. So Unbelievable. this uh, this RNA guided uh, approach to CRISPR Cas9 was described in 2013 in a paper from George Church's lab called RNA-guided human genome engineering via Cas9. So this would, if you wanted to correct a human embryo, which you cannot do at this point in time, this would be the way you would do it. Here they do it with, with mice, and it works. That was originally described in this paper. where they, It's actually now it's uh, open access on uh, PubMed Central, and you can see it. They have a very nice figure showing how all of this works. So I don't I'm going to look up where I, I'm going to look up where I posted that uh, video. So if people want to go back and look at it, they can. I don't know how many embryos they had to screen, or how many pups they had to screen. They don't, they don't tell you that. But they did get, they got both. Uh, they they screened sixty six pups and got five. Okay, that's, that's somewhere in the rate. methods. Yeah. 
So 66 is not bad. That's like... I uh, think they had five, five. They had five that actually showed evidence for both mutations. Mm-hmm. Okay? Right. But then they, then they got to sort it out among those uh, guys that have both mutations on one chromosome. Right. So now you right. got a right. uh, yep. now you got a hetero uh, hetero. Um, it's a something. heterozygote with, heterozygote. With, the, with the correct phase of linkage. When I read that, I just loved it. It's a genetic concept. Right. Mm-hmm. When yeah. whether alleles at two linked loci are coupled or in repulsion is referred to as the phase of linkage. So right. some mice so have both cis. So some mice have both amino acids, human, and some have one, right? Some mice, so it's basically the mice that they describe either have all of the amino acids as human or they have essentially one chromosome where it's, it's the mouse version right, and right. the other chromosome okay. is the human version. Right. So, so right. 288 and 330 are always together. They're not separated. In they're, the mice. They're, they're either both human or, yes. or both yes. mice. Yeah. Okay. They're in phase. Yep. Uh, this this uh, video is uh, my pick in TWIV 329. Not so long ago. Okay. Well, it is 100 ago, but yeah, it's still well. Hey, Dixon, you here? You betcha. Okay. So this, it turns out, this approach gives you, doesn't change the, the protein levels, and which is good, and it doesn't mess up things that are related to the function of DPP, like mm. glucose homeostasis, T-cell activation status, and so forth. So that's good so far. All right, so then they infect these with mer- with a couple of different MERS coronavirus isolates. And uh, these viruses will not replicate in wild-type mice, that is, mice that have not been manipulated in the way we've talked about, uh, but in mice that have uh, these these altered DPP-4 residues, these coronaviruses will replicate. And that happens in both the homozygote that has two copies of the humanized right. uh, receptor and the heterozygote that has only one copy of the humanized receptor. And that's mm-hmm. that's an interesting way to call it. Humanized would be okay, even though it only is two amino acids, but it's okay. Well, right, but it's it's humanized from the perspective, for, for yeah, the sake of this okay. experiment. Yeah, because, of course, the whole protein is not human, remember. It's just these two right. amino acids. That's all you need to do so that you don't mess with the mouse function of, of this protein. Um, so they these viruses, these coronaviruses, MERS coronaviruses will replicate, but they do not make disease. They don't cause severe clinical disease in these animals, which of course is not good because you want to have disease. That's the whole point of that's this. What you want to model. You use modeled, modeled the same kind of respiratory distress that's happening in people. And so they've got a model that replicates virus, but they don't have disease. So what they do they have a uh, mer- what they call a MERS zero virus, which is derived from an infectious DNA clone. They call this a recombinantly derived virus, which um, is a little, I think, awkward, but it's derived from an infectious DNA clone. And then they pass it from mouse to mouse in these uh, 288, 330 heterozygous mice 15 times. <sighs> Uh oh! Uh oh! All the cops. <laughs> Gain of function. Gain of function. No, it was just a mouse-to-mouse resuscitation. Oh, Ooh. Mm. Dixon, you woke up. I've been awake for a long time. Did I bother you? Uh, what? <laughs> Being awake? <laughs> oh, that. <laughs> I don't know. Ask Rich. So this mouse, this virus is called MERS fifteen. Seventy percent mortality, and they they. They write wow. in parentheses, this is genuine mortality, not just losing weight <laughs> and having well, to kill them. And that's important, right? Yeah, it is important when you're doing pathogenesis studies because, yeah, sometimes we know that it, we're pretty sure from before we had to do this, before we were required to do this, that sometimes mice would get really sick, but then they would recover. But also um, here- but now when they get- really sick, you have to euthanize, euthanize them when they have a certain right. amount of weight left. Yeah, a certain amount of weight, so you have to kill them. So you really don't know if they would have died. And here they're dying. Right. And um, they have. They also have weight loss. They have a lot of uh, virus replication in the lungs, more so with this adapted strain than MERS zero. And uh, this, interestingly, despite all of this, this virus, MERS-15, will not replicate in wild-type mice. You have to have the humanized DPP-4. 
four in there. And importantly, there's no neurological complications. There's no there are no obvious neurological signs. There's no paralysis or brain inflammation. There's no virus in the brain, and that's good because that's not part of the MERS pathology syndrome. Right. Um, and I so, presume their next paper is going to be co- to compare the original virus that didn't cause disease with the virus that does cause disease. The passive, uh, yeah. This paper. Yeah, it's a little bit, a little, right. little bit in here. Although okay. Okay. Uh, I would say they 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 left it open to do more papers on that. Okay. Because they did sure. some. Um, so they, well, this, they got sequence anyway. They got sequence, yeah. They This virus, MERS-15, causes a severe lung disease, and they do a variety of, of, of measurements of that, including looking at the inflammatory infiltrates in the lung, looking at the respiratory pathology, yep. uh, and also looking at um, plethysmography, yes. unrestrained plethysmography, uh, which I didn't know before. This, but it is a way to measure the volume in the lungs when the muscles of respiration are relaxed. However, it's a unitless measure. <laughs> One of them is a unitless measure. Yes. <laughs> so what's the what is it? Then? Uh, the pause the, uh, the pause en- enhancement is expressed yeah. in pause enhancement units. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I was actually a little. I, I'm not entirely sure what these two measurements mean but they're they appear to be in literature used as markers of of respiratory problems Mm. um there's pause enhancement and um what was it um expiratory flow expiratory flow 50 Um, yeah the the enhanced pause supposedly reflects airway obstruction restriction due to debris in the airway right and mid-title it's mid-title expiratory expiratory flow. flow Representing um, the flow rate at which 50% of the tidal volume has been expelled in a single breath. And that correlates with, apparently correlates with respiratory distress. Right. Hmm. So what they find from all this is that these this virus, MERS-15, causes respiratory distress, severe respiratory distress in mice, in these hum- DPP-4 humanized mice, which is consistent with the severe respiratory pathology associated with fatal MERS coronavirus infection. There's one published case study of a human fatal MERS coronavirus infection. That's what they can use to compare to this mouse model. Mm. So that's good. No brain, and we have respiratory disease. Yep. Uh, and, uh, just as a side note, a lot of people have died of MERS, mm-hmm. but they, uh, if I understand this correctly, uh, they're dying in a country that doesn't want to do autopsies or release the results. Is that correct? Mm-hmm. It's correct. Think, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the so that's why we ha- that's why we have a dearth of data. A dearth yes. of data. Yeah, that's very good. Uh, then they did uh, Dixon's experiment. They sequenced uh, <laughs> some of this this passage virus. They uh, isolated some clones and they they determined their sequence. And they have a variety of unique missense mutations. Mm which were acquired during passage in mice in non-structural proteins, NSP2, NSP6, NSP8, a large deletion in ORF4B. And um, they don't go through and ask which of these are important for the pathology, and that will be, I'm I'm sure, future work because there's already enough in here. But that's the beginning. They know the the sequence differences and uh, which ones are important, we don't know. So I'm... I'm I'm amazed at uh, the um, the co-parallel approaches, which a resulted in the uh, production of the yellow fever virus vaccine, which started with a virulent strain and ended with an avirulent strain. And here we have an avirulent strain, and we end up with a virulent strain by serial yes. passage. So you've got the same technology that gives you two different, completely different results. And I think that's quite astounding actually and and not just the yellow fever vaccine the um sabin polio vaccine was sure. serial passage sure. product sure what do you think well determines interestingly the if you took this yeah well uh, that's right what do you think determines this <laughs> right interestingly if you took this virus that had been passaged in mice i would uh i'll, I'll bet good money that it's attenuated in humans yes okay mm-hmm. so it would probably be a vaccine theoretically or at least yeah. closer to a vaccine than the wild yeah, type. because you're passing it in yeah. the wrong host, yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. 
human virus. And that's, I think that's the key with the other mm-hmm. attenuated strains that have been done is you right. passage them right. in systems that are not the host you want to protect. So the yellow fever right. vaccine was passaged many times in chick embryos, right? Wow. You know, over 150 times. So why right. didn't it get more virulent as this one has here? Well, it started out virulent and then became... Yeah, so, so maybe you couldn't get any more virulent. No, yeah. but that doesn't explain why it got I mean, virulent, though. You know, in the old days, I mean, here, 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 it wasn't virulent to begin with. You're right. So, I was mean, the yellow fever vaccine passed in chick embryos or in monkeys uh, cells? No, because there's a there's a difference. A lot of these a lot of these um, vaccines are passaged in cell culture, yeah, sure. where you don't have any right. immune system, so they get lazy with respect to fighting immunity. And that, that has a profound attenuating effect. It just and how slide. developed is the immune system in a chick embryo? Exactly. exactly. All right, and so what's the relationship to a human immune system? You know? The attenuated vaccine was derived by attenuated, by serial passages in chicken embryo tissue culture. Huh. There, there you go. go. There you go. Huh. And, you know, interestingly, the vaccine is produced in embryonated chicken eggs. Hmm. Right. Okay. But they take the uh, cells from the eggs and make cell cultures out of them, right? Hundred over a hundred and fifty passages. So, so you're talking about a, a different vertebrate species, and you're talking about doing it in the absence of any yeah. sort of, yes, right. uh, sure. at least sure. adaptive immune response. Yeah. So, that's a, so, there, so the virus gets fat, happy, and dumb. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You can't. <laughs> you can't. You can't talk about getting more virulent because it's a cell culture. Right. Right. All you could do is at best say it's killing them, or maybe it's out of path the beginning. Or something. Yeah, something like that. Right. But. A plaque assay. And they probably had some sort of. <laughs> they probably had some sort of animal model to assess uh, some correlate of uh, virulence, because that's what's usually done with a vaccine. And how long ago was you that? Got, <clears throat> Sorry, I don't know. You got it there, Vincent. Late fifties, early sixties. What? When was this? When the, the, yeah, the first. Uh, yeah, the yellow, yellow fever. fever oh, nineteen thirty-four. Oh. 30 uh, yeah, I have a paper four. that says 1935. Uh, first in mouse embryonic tissue, after 17 passages, it was named 17D and further cultivated until passage 58 in whole chicken embryonic tissue. Yeah. Uh. And thereafter until 114 in denervated chicken embryonic tissue only. So no cells in culture at all. Right. We well, so didn't have cell culture. I had looked at the WHO <laughs> description of the vaccine. The hell with them. They're wrong. <laughs> yeah, this is a oh my gosh. This is a paper talking about the molecular basis of viral attenuation. That was an um, attenuated def- definition. You know, <laughs> I now I no longer trust WHO. Oh my yeah. goodness! Oh my goodness! How can they? Have well, they've done such a bat- bang up job eradicating polio. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> Two, three, four. Try the veal. <laughs> that, a couple of other things they do that are of interest, and we'll move on. And the whole point of making a model is so you could test vaccines and therapeutics and learn about yeah. pathogenesis, right? So they show that a monoclonal antibody against MERS coronavirus, when given to these mice, will protect them 100% against challenge with MERS-15, reduces viral loads, no no loss of respiratory function. So you could use this mouse as a to discover new therapeutics. And they also do a vaccine uh, test. They have a Venezuelan equine encephalitis replicon um, where they produce, they insert the gene encoding the MERS coronavirus spike protein. They vaccinate mice with these virus-like particles, um, and um, they're protected from challenge. So you could use them as well to uh, look for vaccines for MERS as well. Although, if um, Alan, you may remember in our discussion with Marion Koopmans, you know these would be camel vaccines, and uh, right. My camel then, is fine. My camel's it's fine. Sick. My camel's fine. <laughs> yeah, the camel's right. not sick, so who that's cares? Right. Yeah. Okay. In fact, I'd walk a mile for a camel. Uh, we did use that in, in one of our... Yes, I think uh, we did. Okay, so um, this is a new mouse model for MERS coronavirus uh, infection and disease, acute respiratory disease. And oh. it's they say the first time that the CRISPR-Cas9 has been used to genetically edit a non-permissive host receptor... So this is so confusing. They say a non-permissive host receptor. Mm. I don't know if you can use permissive to talk about a receptor. Mm. To generate a susceptible model. Now, there's the susceptible word. Mm -hmm. Uh They're mixing up all these things, Uh left and right. And if, uh, you know, I'm sure virologists don't mind because they know what's going on here, but it could be worse. 
And as they note in the discussion, um, gain of gain of function studies were absolutely necessary to develop a mouse <laughs> model that reflects the pathology observed previously in humans infected with this respiratory pathogen. Mm-hmm. Mm. Um, I I believe that this passage work, uh, the fifteen passage was halted initially with the original gain of function moratorium, and they had to write to get permission to continue it. And so these studies are, are if you notice, this is somewhat delayed as. Yes. With respect to a lot of the other MERS work, and that's why. The last sentence of the paper is, it is critical that the gain-of-function regulatory structure does not impede the development of robust animal animal models of human disease, which are essential for protecting the public health. And that's true. This is important work, and I'm sure there's some people out there who are going to scream about it, but it has to be done. You just have to be careful. Do it under the right containment. And this And this is an excellent example of... You know, these are the kinds of results you can get safely when you allow this kind of research. And now you've got an animal model where you can test drugs and vaccines in in a tractable system that's a whole lot cheaper and a whole lot easier to work with and, and genetically manipulable compared to non-human primates. Got it. Another that's advantage over non-human primates uh, that they point out is that those rely on quantitative RT-PCR Yes. rather than measures of infectious virus to quantify the viral loads. And that also the non-human primates don't reproducibly result in the respiratory disease or mortality as is seen in humans. Right. So we, we talked about the disadvantages of the other mouse models, but the disadvantage of the non-human primates, in addition to the, them being expensive resource-wise, are, there are a couple advantages over that as well. Now, they they do concede that there are some disadvantages to this mouse model as well, that they have mm-hmm. to put in a fairly large inoculum um, in order to get an infection. And what you'd like is something where you can put in a much smaller dose of virus through the respiratory route to get this kind of disease. But at least you're getting a realistic model of the, of the pathogenesis, even if you're not getting a realistic model of the of the um, transmission. Right. You could also argue that adapting the virus is not ideal, right? Because it's well, not, right. you know, it's not the uh, oh, natural right. isolate, but at least you have something to work with. I mean, you can't really do screens in non-human primates if you wanted to screen drugs or no. or vaccines, and and you can do that in mice. It's much easier. Yeah. So, speaking of attenuation, I'm afraid I'm going to have leap? to attenuate my state. You want to tell us about your pick before you? I'd go. love to. Uh, it's actually a. Um, an accumulation of all the orbits that the Cassini satellite has uh, uh, incurred throughout its history of circling uh, the planet Saturn, and I picked it just for you, Rich. I'm oh, neat. Luck here. This, this, what that picture is? is yeah, it? yeah, exactly. So they're getting smaller and smaller? They are, and eventually, of course, uh, I think in a couple of weeks, they're going to crash it into the cloud layer of, of, v, of, of uh, Saturn to uh, wow. get rid of it. Oh, that's nice. Cool. It looks like a spirograph cool. representation, it does. doesn't it? Though? Yes. But those are the actual orbital paths that it took. Dixon, aren't they concerned about the effect of I would the be. crash on any life on the planet? I would be very <laughs> concerned about that, but uh, Saturn appears to be pretty hostile with regards to any kind of life forms that we may imagine. So I don't know, because I think the whole thing will just disintegrate when it yeah. goes into the cloud cover. Cool. But we don't yeah. know. So, anyway. And we'll get, we'll get interesting, we should get interesting data as it crashes right that's right uh, th- it's going to take pictures all the way until it can't and uh, uh, i mean it'll <laughs> hit it'll hit the surface or it'll hit whatever the heck is at Got the it. core and they're going to pass this. it through the rings occasionally before they yeah. do that too so they're maybe they'll crash into a big boulder of uh, ice before you die you see the rings <laughs> exactly right <laughs> at any rate this is so awesome enjoy thank the spirograph you. representations thank you Dixon. Yeah. see you next time thank you, go uh, go save the world <laughs> <laughs> well go to try all right go now. get rich i know that what it's, that's what it's all about with you all about money um have a good weekend everybody bye bye all right you yeah. too you too Dixon. see you you don't have to come back okay <laughs> oh be nice <laughs> He knows I doesn't. I don't mean it, right, Dixon? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> don't let the door slam behind you, okay? <laughs> this episode is brought to you by Curiosity Stream, the world's first ad-free nonfiction streaming service. They have over fifteen hundred titles and six hundred hours of content. Founded by John Hendricks, who used to be from Discovery Channel. And that means you're going to get real science shows. You can get it on the web or any of those little devices that you use to 
interface the web and your TV, like the Roku or the Apple TV, 196 countries. What they have is a wide variety of science, technology, nature, history, documentaries, interviews, lectures, things like Stephen Hawking's favorite places. This is a new documentary where he pilots a CGI spaceship and stops at some of his favorite destinations. One of them is Saturn. I hope he's not there when the, the thing crashes. Cassini's crashing into Saturn, or is it something else? Is anyone I think listening? He's crashing into Saturn. Uh, yeah. 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 I hope I hope Stephen Hawking is not there when Cassini crashes. Yeah. Right. Well, what are the odds it'll hit him? <laughs> it's like Skylab. Digits is a three-part series hosted by Derek Mueller, creator of the YouTube science channel known as Veritasium that explores online safety and security as never before seen interviews with Edward Snowden and Vince Cerf. Deep Time History is a documentary on the history of the universe and Underwater Wonders of the National Parks. It takes you underneath the bodies of water in our national parks. And that's just a sampling. There's a lot of great stuff there. Listeners of microbe TV shows, I think will like it has also one of the largest nonfiction 4K libraries around over 50 hours of ultra-high definition content. They have monthly and annual plans available, and they start at just $2.99 a month, less than a cup of coffee, which is the new meme, right? Everything you compare to a cup of coffee because everyone's always drinking coffee, and they don't even think about spending many, many two ninety nines a day on a cup of coffee, which you just rent, really. Check out. Well, you rent anything you ingest. <laughs> yes, but not Curiosity Stream. No, no. Actually, you, you do rent it <laughs> as well. <laughs> of course, you but rent it. you keep it the knowledge. You do. Hopefully, you keep the knowledge. Check out curiositystream.com slash microbe. Use the promo code microbe during your sign-up process. You will get unlimited access to the world's top documentaries and nonfiction series, and that's completely free. For the first 60 days, that's two entire months free of one of the largest nonfiction 4K libraries around. Just go to curiositystream.com slash microbe and use the offer code microbe at sign up. We thank CuriosityStream for their support of TWIV. We have now some email for your entertainment. First one is from Jory, who says, hello, Tweeple. This is a new one, I think. <laughs> that's good. Mm -hmm. I hope being called a person isn't offensive. My question is, no, no, no problem. My question is simple and relates to the multi-component virus paper. All right, so this was done a while ago. This is a new virus discovered right. in mosquitoes where the genome is packaged separately. Does anyone remember how many segments uh, there were? There were like five or something. And there, and there, there was were, a lot. You need them all to infect, or most of them you need to infect, not all of them. I think one was dispensable. And they're packaged yep. in separate particles. So a jury wants to know why, in this case, does multi-hit kinetics necessarily imply that the segments are packaged in distinct particles? Couldn't multi-hit kinetics result from a requirement for higher gene dosage? What if each particle contained all segments, but many particles were required for infection? If I had to put money on it, I'd still bet on the conclusion from the paper being true, given all of their evidence. However, I also think there may be an issue in claiming that distinct packaging allows follows deductively from multi-hit kinetics. It would be an honor to have you correct me on this. Am I missing something? Please keep up the good and important work. Combating my boredom while pipetting is truly a noble cause. <laughs> Jory is a biology undergrad at Concordia University in Montreal, Canada. Well, this is a good question. Does anyone have insight? I don't necessarily have insight except just thinking about it. And I think what he says is perfectly logical that if there were a situation where you required uh, more than one identical particles to create a productive infection, I think you would see uh, multi-hit kinetics, I believe. Um, uh, I th uh, in this particular case, they had a bunch of other evidence that uh, it was separate particles. One of the, as I recall, one of the sort of lead-in pieces of evidence was that the particles were of a size that was too small to accommodate the full-length genome. That's right? it. 
Yes. But they did other right. things as well that's okay, right. to, to prove it. Right. There uh, were multiple I, lines I, of evidence, but but yes. this is this is a good point that um, I, I th- see it the same way Rich does and uh, would be interested in being corrected if the math doesn't work out. But right. it seems to me that the multi-hit kinetics just mean that you need, say, five particles to start the infection. It doesn't necessarily mean that each one brings a different piece. Right. So, yes, it could be higher gene dosage, unless I've got that wrong. There was another bit of evidence which involved different colored infected cells, I think. Yes. Uh, which I don't recall yes. at the moment. I think that they had, they had, they put uh, expressing different uh, color proteins from different right. segments. Right. And, uh, and they, infected, and they a, infected, infected cells and you don't get a, you don't get a uniform uh, not all the cells get all of the colors. Right, that's right. right. And, yeah. yeah. They so had they, a purification they had other of these. Yeah, they had other evidence. Okay, that's good. Uh, and I have to say, we get a number of these where people are listening to TWIV while they're doing something like plaque assays or something like that. <laughs> I couldn't do that. I, I guess I'm the wrong generation. But I can't have, in particular, something that I would... Music, maybe, okay, but something that I have to, I can't, I can't do a plaque assay and listen to a conversation at the same yeah, time. I'm I sorry. Know, I know what you mean. Uh, uh. I, I can't listen to a book in the car and drive. I cannot concentrate. But it's funny, I can listen to a podcast, but I, for some well, reason, that, cannot listen to a book. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, I don't, I don't like, I usually don't like anything on in the car. Um, and I'm definitely a monotasker. I like to do one thing. So if you go for a six-hour drive, you're not going to play anything in the car? Um, generally, no. Man. <laughs> I mean, Boy, I used are you to. you boring, Alan? <laughs> I know. I, I used to. I, I used to, but um, I got to a point where I just, you know, I, I play little mental strategy games of which lane I should be in and when and and. So you've got your own Just, podcast in your mind too. I, I yeah. have I have a whole soundtrack going on in my head. You yes. can't you can't license plates or something like that. No, no, yeah. it's uh, it's just like watching what's going on around me. Hmm. You're supposed to be driving, dude. I know, and I am driving, and that's part of it. All right, Kathy, can you take the next one, please? Sure. Anthony writes Senator Menendez YouTube on Zika, and he gives the link. Have you considered writing Senator Menendez to express support? A few words from an independent expert can only help. In the 14 hours or so that the video's been up, it's only gotten 72 views. And so the video was published on September 8th. And when I looked at this on November 25th, there were still only 157 views. But after I watched it, it didn't register mine. So maybe the counter is wrong. Or it updates uh, when you load. Ah, uh, yeah, I haven't been back to it. It's got 163 now. 163 okay. right now. Right. But this is Senator Menendez from New Jersey uh, asking for Congress to fund Zika research. Right. Um, Anthony continues. There was the three monkeys, and I don't mean non-human primates in the lab response to AIDS. One would hope that the government and public would want to make certain that there'd be no next time. It's sad, if not a tragedy, that that's not so. Thank you. So I didn't get the three monkeys response to AIDS. Does anybody? Either. Oh, I think no. I got it. See no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil. Oh. Maybe. Uh, I think that's what that was. Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. okay. Not and, to be confused with the movie 12 Monkeys. <laughs> a great anyway. movie, by the way. That would yes. be a pick. <laughs> At the end of uh, this video, uh, Senator Menendez has a line that I really liked. He says, we hear a lot about protection of the unborn. Well, this is the very essence of being able to protect the unborn. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah, he's right. It's not a bad thing for us to say, hey, Senator, this is great. We support it, but we don't, we didn't do it. It's kind of a long, it's, it's done. It's it's a while ago, right? Yeah. Yeah. Alan, could you take the next one, please? Yes. Um, let's see. Basil writes, we've heard from Basil or a Basil before, right? Yes, yes absolutely. Um, 
Hi, Dr. Rackenyello. I don't know if this message will make the cut for today's recording of TWIV, but I thought of sharing this news story. And um, this is a, oh, a yes, Bob Sears, um, this uh, nut who's a um, pediatrician out in California who's an anti-vaccine guy. Um, looks like he may be losing his medical license. So that's some good news. Um, so yeah, California decided that he improperly excused a toddler from immunization and, uh, they're categorizing that quite, quite appropriately as gross negligence. He offers alternative immunization schedules to allow parents to get vaccination in a way they're more comfortable with. (sighs) Yeah. Yeah. He has written a book. Making the Right Decision for Your Child About Vaccines, has sold more than 250,000 copies and made him a celebrity among parents who see peril in the mandatory vaccination regime. Uh, you know, I see peril in Ebola virus. Yes, I see peril in chicken pox. Mm-hmm. Oh my gosh. Why and do measles. People, why do people... Oh, well. Hmm. He's yeah. making money. Well, he'll be making less of it as a doctor if this goes through, so that's something. Um. Uh, I read an article in the local Austin paper this morning about how uh, Texas is becoming sort of an anti-vax haven. Well, you have the Godfather uh, living there. We have the Godfather living right here in Austin. That's correct. The, the leader um, of the cult. And apparently there's there are packs and all sorts of stuff. He even talked about people moving from California to Texas. <laughs> <laughs> because California is getting tough. Give me a break. Okay. <laughs> Rich, can you take the next one, please? Uh, Josh. Yeah, jo- Josh writes, listening to the podcast, and I wanted to let you know that there are some of us out there who fell in love with a microbial world in college but did not end up in the lab. I'm a physician, and my college friend, both of us molecular and cellular biology majors, is a dentist. And this stuff still fascinates us. Mm -hmm. So much science has happened in the years since graduation, and your podcast is an outlet for that part of me to think and explore. I still think about how DNA uh, came from RNA. Is there any evidence for an evolutionary process? It seems too big of a jump. It's hard to think of a unicellular organism having the kind of perspective to (laughs) orchestrate that. Maybe a virus was involved. Any idea? Anyway, keep up the good work. Doctors are busy, and you might want to try and get in with the Infectious Diseases Society of America to target some of the more likely physicians to subscribe. So, uh, yeah, RNA to DNA, I mean, this is all a black box, I think, right? Well, one of the major things about evolution is that it doesn't require a perspective. Yeah. <laughs> it just it just is randomly going on, and something at some point... For some reason, um, the deoxy form of the nucleic acid was more advantageous to something. And um, and then, because of its inherent chemical characteristics, it became the repository of the genes, and the RNA became the, um, the intermediary between there and the proteins. It's hard to know because it was a long time ago, but presumably RNA— Even Vincent wasn't around. I wasn't around. RNA was likely first— and they likely evolved an enzyme, a protein, to copy it at some point. And that, you know, not many changes are needed in that enzyme to make it a reverse transcriptase right. from an RNA polymerase. So that's the idea of how RT is, may be the link between the RNA and the DNA world. It didn't happen overnight, though, because if you think about it. If you, if, you know, an enzyme arises one day that can make DNA from RNA, who's going to use the DNA? There's nothing around to use it yet. <laughs> Right, so it's going to be a while. Well, it would have it would have copied some <laughs> RNA into DNA. Yeah, and, and then because the DNA was more stable, maybe it survived. Yeah, um, who knows? Longer, and then that DNA got passed on and happened to encode a reverse transcriptase, and yep. that's that's a plausible mechanism. But yeah, we we didn't see it. No, it's all a lot of thought experiments, unfortunately. But it's pretty neat to think about. Anyway, yeah, origin I'm, of origin of life stuff is biology's cosmology. It is. You know, physicists have, have where did the universe come from, and there's all sorts of wacky theories about that, and nobody can really prove most of them. We've got where did life come from. 
Yeah, it's compelling. People like to hear about it, as you can see. Sure. But it's good to hear that some docs are listening. It's yeah. Good. Yep. Mm-hmm. Our next one's from Finney, who writes, I've been a big fan of the Wall of Polio and your weekly podcast about virology. Often research in Europe barely makes news on the other side of the Atlantic. I thought I'd share a bit about my own work by paying tribute to the original wall by building my own mini wall of semliki and chikungunya. An MSc virology student from India, I joined the group of Dr. Tiro Ahola at the University of Helsinki, Finland, as a PhD student five years ago to work on antivirals against chikungunya. Over the course of my research, I had to perform hundreds of plaque assay titrations. As I was about to leave the lab this fall, I decided to keep some of the late last plates to build up this wall. These are only plates since last December. Thought you might find it interesting. I attach my CV as well. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, I'd like to thank you for the amazing work you do and your tremendous enthusiasm and passion teaching people about the viral world. So uh, Finney sent a couple of pictures, four pictures, which are pretty cool. We'll put, this is awesome. We'll put links to yeah. those in the show I'm notes. The really wall of Senliki and Chikungunya. It is made in um, in the form of the wall of polio. It's even got a little sign in front. Yeah. I don't and know I, I love what he did with putting them in the window. That's gorgeous. The window is cool, mm-hmm. yeah. So they're mm-hmm. all backlit. Well, a big clump of them are backlit, and then there's the, the bit in front. Yes. So he made he filled in a window. Yes. Yeah. That's right. Um, I don't want to fill mine in. I have a good view. Yes. That's an option. Yeah. Not very good. Nice. I like these things. I'll have to put. Yeah, we will put pictures up. That's cool. It's a lot of plaque assays. It is a lot of plaque assays. Yep. Uh, Kathy, you're next. Okay, Gavin yep. Gavin writes, Gavin. Dear Triv Team, as a patron of the show, I have no problem with advertising or how it is currently being delivered. In my opinion, complaints about advertising are more of a distraction than the ads themselves. <laughs> my own motivation for becoming a patron is a sense of gratitude. I'm a second-year master's student in a virology lab, but my institution has not offered a virology course in several years. Dr. Racaniello's online lectures were instrumental in helping me transition from my chemistry undergrad to a virology master's program. In addition, TWIV and TWIP keep me engaged during my daily commute. I owe you much more than what I can contribute on a monthly basis, and I am glad that your sponsors are able to make up the difference. Below, I've included my mini essay for the book contest. My significant other is a graphic designer, and we share an appreciation for the beauty of the natural world. When we first started dating, I gave her my copy of The Architecture of Molecules by Linus Pauling and Roger Hayward. It contains pastel drawings from Hayward with a brief description for a lay audience by Pauling. You can find excerpts here, and he gives a link. In return, she made me a calendar with illustrations of viruses as she saw them. I've attached a PDF copy. Thanks again for all that you do, and keep up the fantastic work. I am patiently awaiting the release of the sixth edition of Parasitic Diseases. Uh, V slash R. I have to say say that this is the geekiest romance I think I've ever seen. <laughs> this is awesome. <laughs> good, yeah, good it's a you. really, it's a really good one. Yep. Um, so, Gavin, uh, P.S. I'm fortunate enough to be interviewing at Columbia University College of Physicians and Surgeons on October 24th. I know this is a long shot, but I would be the envy of my peers if I could get my picture taken in front of the wall of polio. And then he says, "Herpes viruses are like Donald Trump; they're very successful, and you just can't seem to get rid of them." I may be, this is all still this PS, right? Yeah, okay. I may be a bit biased by working in a lab that deals primarily with HSV, but I like to be a herpes virologist, especially HSV too. Oh, this is his essay. This is his essay, yeah. Yeah, okay. I like to be a herpes virus, specifically HSV2. These large DNA viruses always seem to have the answers to life's problems. For every weapon in our immunological arsenal, HSV2 encodes a countermeasure or carries out a preemptive strike. With regard to their preparedness, they are the Boy Scouts of the virus world. In addition, herpes viruses have the confidence to be true to themselves and are only interested in long-term relationships. HSV2 doesn't rely on a high mutation rate for success. It has taken roughly 1.6 million years to get to know you, and it is perfectly comfortable being itself when you're together. Theories of genetic budget. Quote, not as clumsy as an RNA virus. 
Herpes viruses are elegant viruses for a more civilized age. <laughs> <laughs> and he cites Kenobi et al. All joking aside, herpes simplex viruses are capable of causing serious morbidity and mortality, as well as significant changes in quality of life. Unraveling their many mysteries may hold the key to the development of novel therapies, as well as a greater understanding of our own biological processes. And then he set a link to this calendar. And Which is gorgeous. I yeah, particularly beautiful. like July, of course, because it's an adenovirus. Love so, that. yeah. Uh, what I really like about this calendar is so imaginative. <clears throat> Each page has a big picture of a virus, uh, and then there's this uh, repeating pattern in the background. Yes. So you have to look right. at this related too. So HIV has a bunch of condoms in the background. <laughs> <laughs> Ebola has a bunch of bats. Yes. And what's this? <clears throat> Swine flu has a bunch of pigs. Right, mm -hmm. right. <clears throat> um, yeah. Chicken pox just has pox, I think. I know. Hepatitis, hepatitis C has uh, syringes. Yeah. <clears throat> Polio has wheelchairs. Mm-hmm. And no, just has, has DNA. Yeah. No. Yeah. yeah, herpes. Very, has very lips. cool. I love yes. it. Yes. Yeah. It's really very good. But I, I have to say, I, um, I bristle at the celebrity comparison that Gavin made here. I, I think that is a, a serious insult to herpes viruses. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Truly. <laughs> yeah. Cause, cause herpes viruses, as Gavin pointed out in the essay, you know, these are, these are very highly evolved and, um, you know, they, uh, they, they, have some stick sophistication. Ar they stick around and they are loyal. Um, and I, I think, uh, none of those apply to the other person. Anyway, <laughs> it's very good. I love the calendar. It's cool. To my favorite virologist, gorgeous calendar. The top. Very nice. Very cool. Love it. Thank you very much. Uh, Drobo is back for just a single ad before the holidays. They would like you to know about a special holiday offer on Drobo's. Remember, Drobos are a family of safe and expandable, simple-to-use storage arrays for your computer that protect your data forever. How do they do this? They are multi-tray drive carriers that you just hook up to your computer by a USB or Thunderbolt or FireWire. Well, those are the old ones. Uh, hook up wire. You copy your data onto them, and the data is replicated across the array. And so let's say one drive fails. We just pull it out and put a new one in. The data are back. You don't lose it. If you run out of space, you just put a, pull out one of the drives and put a bigger one in. They're really cool. And they're great for all kinds of people that have lots of data or a little bit of data that you want to preserve. Uh, it's, it's a technology called Beyond RAID. And the cool thing is it's very simple. On the front of this array, which is a, a black box, there are a bunch of lights. There's a light next to each drive. And when it's green, everything is good. When it's yellow, it means one of the drives is filling up. That particular drive, the, the light turns yellow. And when it's red, it's full. You have to pull it out and put a new drive in. And if it's flashing red, the drive has failed. Again, just pull it out and put a new one in. You don't have to be an IT person to get this to work. They're really cool. I've been using them for years. They, they have different kinds with five or eight or 12 hard drive bays. You can even hook them up to your uh, network router or switch, and they can then you could access uh, your data over your home internet or your office, but they have also third-party apps that allow you to access your Drobo anywhere in the world. They have secure ways of accessing it, accessing it which are really, really very cool. So Drobo wanted to just do one ad here at the beginning of December, which, of course, is the month that people are buying presents for each other. And now through December 31st, they are offering listeners of the Twix podcasts the very best deal of the year. You can save 20% or more. That is $100 to $800 off the purchase of a Drobo 5N, a network-attached system, or the Drobo 5D, 5DT, which are Thunderbolt and USB connected Drobos, or any of the 8 or 12 bay unit network systems. 20% off. That's a really good price. So to take advantage of this incredible deal, go to drobostore.com, buy your system, 
enter the code microbe twenty at checkout, and they'll tell you how to get your your discount. Take take it off at purchase, I guess, or something like that. Okay, drobostore dot com. So you have to do this by December thirty first, twenty sixteen, and use the discount code microbe twenty. So if you've always coveted a twelve drive Drobo, <laughs> you can get twenty percent off of it. This is great. You know, maybe you were thinking the previous savings wasn't enough. Yeah, this is cool. You can do this. So check it out. We thank Drobo for their sponsorship of TWIV and all the other programs on Micro TV, any of them. And if you listen to any of them, you can get the same discount. We're going to be doing the same ad on all of the other shows uh, as well. Uh, let's see. Alan, can you take the next one, please? Yes. Anthony writes, Twinkle, twinkle, little bat. <clears throat> I'm glad that you found my letter from the hospital amusing. Uh, and I I don't remember this one, but Anthony was in the hospital after a rabies exposure. Is that right? That's right. And he drew a picture of a bat when he was right. in the hospital. He sent it to us. <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, that I was allergic to the duck egg embryo rabies vaccine was a curious feature of the incident. The doctors told my parents that I was expected to die. Nobody told me anything, and I certainly did not present any dramatic rendition of heroism. <laughs> I used the bouts of allergic shock as opportunities for naps. I spent most of the rest of the time that I was kept in isolation watching TV and drinking malteds. Thank you. <laughs> well, I'm glad you didn't die, Anthony. Yeah, I'm glad you yeah. pulled through. And uh, if it were today, I guess you'd be on your cell phone or something. No TV, right? Right. Uh, Rich, can you take the next one, please? Okay, I'm going to use the last name here. Bill Spindler. This is your brother, Kathy? My older brother. Mm -hmm. Older brother. Writes, a comment on what you mentioned on TWIV a bit ago. These two press releases just came out about a new collaboration between NASA and NSF to study the effects of isolation in Antarctica. I will also rotate some of the NASA flight... It will also rotate some of the NASA flight surgeons through the Antarctic medical clinics. There is nothing in the 2016-17 USAP research plan, uh, planning summary about this yet. I looked again. That summary was published before this announcement was made. There really haven't been any of these isolation monitoring studies in a while, and I'm a bit surprised that this collaboration hasn't happened earlier, or perhaps it's just taken a while. And he gives a couple of links to these articles. When I saw, uh, well, I'll come back to this. When I saw the NASA press release, I, was, I instantly recognized a photo of the frosty eyes at the top of the page. They belong to then Christina Hammock, with whom I wintered at the South Pole in 2005, an extremely impressive and awesome person. I wrote about it, and her reply, her reply included the term selfie, although that term hadn't really been invented then. She's now Christina Hammock Koch, a NASA astronaut. I expect to hear more about this NASA NSF joint program at some point. UTMB, that's uh, University of Texas Medical Branch in Galveston, is currently the medical subcontractor for the NSF US Antarctic program. I'm wondering if the NASA involvement will supplant some of the functions of UTMB, hiring staff, managing the PQ, physical qualification process, and providing telemedicine uh, services. Uh, Christian Otto, the Canadian physician I wintered with in 2005, he also wintered at McMurdo earlier, and he also summited Everest as part of a medical team, is currently part of the medical research group at Johnson Space Center uh, as the, the PI on a project studying visual impairment, intracranial pressure risk in astronauts. So uh, the idea here is that uh, wintering in Antarctica, especially some of the more uh, isolated regions in Antarctica, is really a test of uh, human reaction to isolation in a very practical sense. And that sort of... Uh, uh, environment studying humans in that sort of environment uh, could potentially be informative uh, in trying to figure out how uh, astronauts might react to a long duration flight to, for example, Mars. Yeah. So this is these articles uh, study this, and they're actually quite good articles. They're interesting. 
So, Kathy, what did we talk about this at some point? Um, I think there was, you know, so Bill sent this in middle of September, and I think before that there was some discussion about um, either, you know, the isolation of going to Mars or the yeah. isolation or whatever, the Antarctic or maybe both. I don't know, but this mm, is a confluence of them. I think, I think we may have been talking about um, looking at viromes and microbiomes in people who are not surrounded by other people. Uh, yeah, isolations, uh, yeah. That's, yeah. I remember a discussion about that and where would you find such people who are truly isolated and we fielded a couple of ideas and this uh, certainly is a, is a good place. It sounds like there's yeah. always more than one person at these things, right? And these are, yeah, these are generally team efforts um, whereas something like a, a somebody who's doing one of these long ocean races, mm -hmm. they're solo. Right. Um, but yeah, you can still get these. These are generally small teams. So you could get a small group of people who are not having outside contact with the world and look at that. And that yeah, would be a good. Yeah. Right. I, I don't know the numbers of people at the various bases that winter over. I think the number about the the first time that that Bill wintered over, which was in 70s, uh, was somewhere around 25 at the South Pole and. It, that's a larger number now, and it includes women. Um, so, but I, I think some of the other outposts might still be smallish. Hmm. Anyway, when I saw this was coming up in the queue a couple of weeks ago, I wrote to him and asked if there were any updates, and he didn't have any. But he did give us a link to an interesting blog post about winter life in Antarctica in general terms uh, that might be of interest to people as well. So there's a, just a, a couple of bits here to give the idea from one of these uh, articles it's uh it's relatively simple to place subjects in isolation or confinement for the purpose of studying mood and behavior but the extreme uh, uh, environment element is harder to find sometimes called white mars antarctica is perfect because you can't walk off the ice that goes for whether <laughs> mm -hmm. you're having a health behavioral health or personal issue you're not going anywhere um very similar and it's, to space and it's not because somebody locked you up right is no, nobody to, can get you out. Yeah. Right. Very similar to space flight. It changes your mindset about how you're going to respond when you know you can't leave. Uh, how, how extreme is the environment? Not only is 98% of the co continent covered in ice, but it also has extreme winds and an average temperature of minus 49 to 26 degrees, making it, making it the coldest place on Earth. Uh, and the polar night the sun goes beyond the horizon late in April and is not seen again until mid-September. <laughs> you know, once the sun is down, you could be stuck there. Yep. The selfie yep. of uh, Christina Koch it's great. is uh, <laughs> notable as well for the fact that, I mean, I've been in cold before, but I've never had my eyelashes frosted. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This last uh, link... Under your note here, how a Mars voyage will be like enduring an Antarctic winter is good. And there's actually a bunch of good discussion at the bottom of people mm -hmm. people speaking reasonably, like, you know, having good discussions and respecting each other's opinions. Mm -hmm. It's funny. It's different from a lot of biological posts for some reason. All right. The next one is from Paul who writes, Dear Twivome, to the Twivome 28C, 62% humidity, the barometric pressure is falling as a small rain system makes its way across southeastern Pennsylvania. The end of September brings us flu vaccine season and a time to return to the questions around antigenic drift and the need for annual vaccination. Based on this information from WHO and this handy Wikipedia chart of Northern Hemisphere recommended strains, I put together the following chart of 19 years of vaccine recommendations for the Northern Hemisphere and discussion points in the hope that a little discussion will inspire everyone to get vaccinated this and every October. It's the second time now that someone has given us discussion points in a letter. <laughs> Interesting. I'm neither a doctor nor a scientist, but the chart seems to suggest that. Sounds like Star Trek. <laughs> Strains persist, one, the first bullet point, strains persist far more than the popular press and casual explanations for the need to, for annual vaccination suggest. 63% of 59 strain recommendations after 1998 are repeats. 24% of 17 possible formulation repeats were entirely identical to the prior year. I also noticed that too. Yeah. Yeah. 
Second bullet. Multi-year strain persistence implies that both vaccination and natural infection do not provide multi-year protection against even the particular strain of infection or vaccination. Absolutely. It's because the vaccine isn't very good and it wanes. It doesn't have any durability. And not everybody gets infected, which is why you don't get um, immunity from infections. A lot of people do, but they're not, you know, they're just not the group that's infected the following year. Right. Next bullet point. A universal flu vaccine would avoid the strain prediction problem, but there's no reason to think that it would allow us to avoid annual vaccination. Well, that's a good point. I mean, hopefully it would have some durability. Yes. And that's the idea because every that's a big problem with the flu vaccine, not only the antigenic variation, but having to give it every year is really tough. And you're taxing the ability of people to get out there and do that. So people are working hard to try and make it durable, but of course you need a long-term study to do that. So it's going to be a while before we know that. Next bullet. Hypothetically, the inability of immune memory to stave off flu relates to the role of the inflammatory response component of the pathophysiology. Yeah, that's certainly part of it. Um, this makes me ask whether passive immunization might be just as effective as vaccination. If so, might it not be easier to manufacture universal flu antibodies than to reliably cause the body to produce them by vaccination? All right. So I think antibodies are not the whole story. That's the problem. Right. That's part of the problem. You, you need certainly cellular responses as well. And maybe the vaccines don't do a good job at inducing them. And I think making antibodies and giving them to people would be incredibly expensive and it wouldn't last more than a couple of months at best. I don't think it would even last a month. It's a, an antibody, a, a passive immunization is something that you use as an acute intervention for somebody who's about to die of something and you can, you know what they have and you can, you can give them antibodies against it. Um, if somebody doesn't have the flu and you give them antibodies against it, the antibodies are going to wash out in a matter of days, I would think. There's some new formulations that there, get yeah, to better longevity, but yeah, it's not going to last very long. I agree. It's certainly, I don't, I don't think you're going to get through a whole flu season with the same yeah. set of, of passive antibodies. I mean, it would have to be injected mm-hmm. also. And that too. It's, it just seems like it would be very expensive to me. To, to get to that point. But I don't think it's going to work. Even though the vaccines are not great, I think there are better ways to get to where we need to go. Yeah. Chart and legend follow. Do not try to read on air. <laughs> Paul, P.S., thanks for the great show. And he did a really great job of summarizing all these uh, immunization data. So if you're interested in that, check it out. We'll put a link to it in the show notes. Yeah. Uh, Kathy, can you take the next one? Sure. Anthony writes, a neighbor recently returned from a trip home to Ahmedabad, did I say that right? Ahmedabad, yeah, got enough syllables in there, Gujarat, India. He related that the visit was not good because he, his wife, their one-year-old daughter, and his father all fell ill. I asked if it was the flu, and I was told, no, it was viral. (laughs) Oh. (laughs) Uh, And then he gives a link. He says, reading this, it appears that this is flu season for Western India. I'm assuming that influenza was what made them sick. The CDC does advise travelers to India to have received an influenza vaccination. He gives a link to the CDC. What I'm wondering is if the strains circulating in the U.S. and consequently the vaccine are the same for India. If not, should people going there and to other locales with influenza viruses that differ from the United States get the destination country flu shot? If this is done, what effect will it have, if any, on subsequently getting the domestic vaccination? Thank you. Oh, so he actually sent this Question also to Stacy Schultz Cherry. Oh. Mm. And she, she, he said to her, should those traveling to the Southern Hemisphere get the flu shot for that region? And she says, most years the Northern and Southern Hemisphere vaccines have the same composition of viruses. She provides a link so you could see that. Having said that, if you're traveling to the Southern Hemisphere during their flu season and you haven't been vaccinated or it's been some time, you should get the shot. As for which vaccine to administer, in areas with residents that may be traveling to and from the Southern Hemisphere, the best bet is simply to vaccinate, especially kids with the available vaccine. It will provide protection. Okay, so they're close enough, right, most of the time. Right. And this was October 31st. So uh, there you go. That's good. I, I, I did remember that. I didn't paste it in, but Stacy answered that. Good. 
Uh, Alan Dove is next. We'll just do yes. a couple more. All right. Adam writes, Dear Twifsters, greetings from hot, humid, cold, windy, rainy, foggy central Illinois. That's uh, That sounds like Midwestern weather. It's currently 29 degrees Celsius and sunny, but if this is a normal fall, we'll cycle through those other stages by the end of the week. With all the Zika coverage in the news and on TWIV, I've been paying closer attention to the local mosquito species this year. We've had our usual swarm of Culex pipiens mosquitoes, and I occasionally see a stray mosquito with striped legs, which I'm guessing is Edes albopictus. A few weeks ago, I was surprised to see a mosquito more than twice the size of a typical Culex Edes land on my arm and chomp down for a blood meal. I've seen probably half a dozen since then. Some Googling reveals the most likely culprit is uh, Sorophora ciliata, a.k.a. the American gall nipper. (laughs) Hmm. At least they bit you on the arm and not the gall. Has this species ever been discussed on the show before? Is there any evidence that it carries human diseases? We've had some late season rains that likely allowed this species to flourish, but I'm curious why I've never seen them in the spring before. I know what I really need is a This Week in Entomology podcast to bug about this. But you folks are my best source for mosquito insight. Love the show, Adam. And by the way, I would definitely, I I would probably listen to a show called This Week in Entomology. That would be pretty cool. Um, And Vincent has included a link here. I found Uh, one. I found a couple of papers on. Sorophora columbia and uh, uh, Sorophora ciliata. Yeah, this this mosquito is capable of supporting a virus infection, but there's no evidence that. They do carry the viruses in the wild. I don't recall that we've ever discussed those critters on the show. No. No, Too I don't bad think Dixon's so. gone. I asked him about them, and uh, he didn't know much. Okay. But these are you know, bigger mosquitoes, okay. yeah. Um, east of the Continental Divide, that's not very specific where they're found. So they're, I guess they're pretty widespread. Yeah, in this paper, I found, if you search PubMed with... Sorophora and virus, you get three or four papers. And hmm. uh, this one, they try to infect the mosquitoes in the lab, and they do support replication, but uh, they have a salivary gland barrier, so the virus will replicate in the mosquitoes, but they don't transmit it, or very few transmit it. So it doesn't seem like a great host. Oh, and apparently their larvae eat the larvae of other mosquito species. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. So actually, they, uh, despite the fact that they're biting you, that's kind of good news that they're around. Maybe they're reducing the populations of some of the ones that would carry viruses. Right. Oh. But no mosquito is good news. Anyway, uh, I'm working on a bug podcast, Alan. I got a oh. entomologist uh, who's interested, and in, uh, if she's up for it, then we'll do it next year. Oh, awesome. Yeah, I, I, I got to find a good title. I'm not sure this week in entomology. I don't know if I want to continue the this week meme. Okay. Mm-hmm. I really would love to do It's a Bug's Life, but I can't because it's taken, no, right? that's taken, right. But that would be perfect, wouldn't it? Yes. <laughs> uh, let's see. Is Rich Condit next? Uh, yes, you are. You're keeping track. I am keeping this, track. This is great. This is a quote from... Um, Pope Benedict the Sixteenth Facebook page. Uh, quote Mendel, an avid weather lover, later became a weather watcher and record keeper. End quote. And that's Benedict the Sixteenth's quote. And the uh, Anthony, oh, I'm sorry, Anthony writes with that quote. And then Anthony says, maybe I was the only one that didn't know about Mendel's meteorological data collection, but I just learned of it yesterday. Mm-hmm. Twiv shares a thread in the fabric of a great tradition. <laughs> the weather. The weather. Excellent. Wonder, wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you. Excellent. I didn't know that either. Uh, hmm? And by the way, this this is, uh, uh, you know, just a nice little blog by Pope Benedict on Gregor Mendel. Yeah. And mm-hmm. you know, a nice little summary of his life and work. Cool. I want to remind everyone to register today for the ASM Grant Writing Online Course. Its topics will include a broad overview of the Grant Writing Enterprise, writing NIH, NIH and NSF grants and biosketches, and viewing grants from the reviewer's perspective. It's a six-part series that will take place from August through September of 2017. 
you have a lot of time to register. You have until July 15th. But you can go to bit.ly slash ASMGWOC17 to register. That's all one word, bit.ly slash ASMGWOC17. Let's do some science picks of the week. Alan Dove, what do you have today? I have a YouTube video. This is from the American Museum of Natural History, and it shows a time lapse of human population through time. Um, so it starts um, a long, long time ago <laughs> um, with just a just a small like blob in Africa where we know that humans, anatomically modern humans, were found. Um, couple hundred thousand years ago and then it tracks human population not only across the globe but in size and it it has little notes that pop up in the course of the video commenting on on what's happening you know what's been discovered and um and it shows just how far and how fast we've grown but what's really interesting is that for a long long time there just aren't that many of us and even as even as the age of exploration unfolded, you see the population will go up and then it'll come back down again and it'll go up a little and come back down again. And it kind of bops around at, you know, in the millions. And then we get to the modern age and things like the germ theory of infection and we start to figure out why we're dying at age 40. And all of a sudden, bam, it just explodes and you get to 7 billion people and it's just it's very interesting to watch. It's quite amazing, isn't it? Yeah. I've seen Scary. this as a, I've seen this in model form in some museum where they had a big wooden model of um you know population as this graph it and it's just a thin line and then all of a sudden at the end it shoots way up. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah, I'd like to know what's going to happen in the next many years. Yeah, where are we going? Yep. Up 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 so far. Crash, maybe a crash. Maybe a crash. Rich, what do you have? Um, so I I don't know how to justify this, <laughs> except to say that we've had OK Go videos in the past. Yes. Uh, and it's a, it's it's kind of techy uh, and involves some slow motion photography. So this is their latest. Uh, this is OK Go's uh, latest busy video called Walk Her Walk, uh, sponsored, by the way, by Morton Salt. Um, and, uh, it's, uh, you know, one of their crazy videos with just all kinds of stuff happening in sequence. Um, and they start off by showing you a four and a half second clip of this in real time. Uh, and then they show you a clip that takes several minutes. That is the whole thing in slow motion. Okay. Yes. Um, it's, it's, and, a four, uh, it's a four minute video shot in four seconds. It's right. amazing. Yes. yes, it's pretty cool. Now, one yeah. of the most amazing things about it is that they've got a couple of places where they have uh, basically flip books. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Somebody's, mm -hmm. There's somebody's picture, and they're flipping through it, and they must I, – I, this must be a post-production edit. Because if you look at it, uh, the the mouth is synced to the song that's being sung. I think yeah. – I don't, I don't think it's post-production. I think they actually – um, I, I read a blog post about this on a, um, a photography blog that I, that's in my feeds and they put together this massive spreadsheet of everything that needed to happen in each fraction of the second. And, <laughs> and then I guess they would have rehearsed, you know, you need to flip through this flip book in one and a half seconds. God. And so they'd practice doing it until that was the right speed. And then, all right. And when they were all ready, they did this whole thing in the four second take. It is, it is an amazing video. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. could make, you could justify it as the science of making amazing videos. Something mm -hmm. like that. It's okay. You, you often, I've given up. You I've given don't. up trying to, I've given up trying to justify all this. Stuff. Oh, by the way, <laughs> speaking of, no justification. I didn't give the Vendee Globe update. Ah, yes. Uh, Alex Thompson, the Brit, is now back in first place after uh, having a leg for a little while. They're in the Southern Ocean approaching uh, Australia. And uh, the, uh, I'll tell you, there's a recently a French helicopter from some ship uh, found him and 
I, I should include this as my pick next week. Uh, <laughs> and um, uh, shot a video of him. It's just to seeing these guys sailing in the Southern Ocean the way they are is absolutely terrifying. Yes. <laughs> But he's holding on. He's back in first place. There you go. The two leaders are like 15 nautical miles apart, and then the next one is like 500 miles in the, in the rear. Nice. Wow. Kathy, what do you have? I picked something about the Aberdeen bestiary, and what I picked is a link to a website called Hyperallergic, and uh, it talks about this lavishly illuminated bestiary, and these are medieval uh, books. This is filled with paintings of animals, and they illustrate tales of moral behavior. But they're gorgeous. And the article tells about some of the features of this particular one, which wasn't finished and has fingerprints on it in such a way that you know that it was probably read to people and then held by the top and, and shown to them in a you know small semicircle sitting around. Um, the way that they... Uh, transferred some things is by this process called pouncing where uh, holes are poked into something so that you basically trace it by by using these holes and it reminds me of the uh, thing that you do when you sew if you want to transfer a pattern uh, you use this thing called a fabric tracing wheel anyway i thought the pictures were really lovely and it was it's pretty cool because you can zoom in on it mm. and the article highlight some things and so i'm sorry dixon will never see this but i thought he would have enjoyed it <laughs> nope he will never see it it's pretty cool it is very neat love very it. very cool beautiful hyper allergic uh, i have a uh, pick which is an article in stat news it's called take our quiz can you out science an eighth grader <clears throat> And it's it's uh, by Mega Satyanarayana Satyanarayana no Satyana Rayana <laughs> I think that's right. What's a cell an organelle a ganglion an acromion eighth grade biology? Well, the National Center for Education Statistics says science scores for eighth graders have inched up since 27, but on the whole are still below what it considers proficient. Can you remember what you learned back then? And there's a test for you to take. There are 10 questions. Check it out. Here on TWIV, we all got 10 out of 10, right? Well, yep. yeah. Dixon didn't cool. take it, of course. Yeah, woo -woo, it's a good thing. You don't want to not get one of them, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that's my pick. I also want him to mention a curious sign that I found this past week. I spent a couple of days in Florida, went into a... Uh, uh, Needle needlework store, and in the window they had a sign saying "Warning: Stitching box very contagious." <laughs> <laughs> Symptoms: Patient has glazed expression, fear of kitchen and laundry area, frequently checks floss supply, hoards small fabric scraps, counts to self. No known cure. Treatment disease is not fatal. Victim should visit Stitches by the Sea as soon as possible. I thought that was really funny. Mm -hmm. That's good. Stitches yeah. by the Sea. All right, we have a listener pick from Hannah. Greetings, TWIV team. I was reading about the National Collection of Type Cultures for Work and came across this website, which I'd like to offer as a listener pick. It's normalflora.co.uk. It's the site of a British artist who makes art out of microbes. Her most recent project, Microbe Mouth, is probably the best, I think. She's making art out of teeth produced by hydroxyapatite-producing bacteria. Some of her older projects are quite interesting as well, from sculpting the concept of a fecal transplant to making dresses that illustrate bacterial communication. I realize it is not strictly virus-related, but it's worth poking through anyway. Love the show. Hannah from Boulder, Colorado, where it's about 40 degrees Fahrenheit, 4C, and cloudy. It's a cool site. Hey, it is science. Yeah. As, at least it's science, Hannah, in contrast to Rich Condit. <laughs> <laughs> these are these are cool. Yeah, they're pretty neat. Yeah, and the teeth are pretty awesome. And yeah. Yeah. The scientific team that she's collaborating with as well. The that's kind of cool that they found um, bacteria at a mine site that can um, produce uh, what hydroxyapatite mm -hmm. yeah. crystals, and and they're trying to use this to, I guess, manufacture teeth. 
It's interesting cool. because I uh, tried to find out a little more about the hyperallergic site, and their thing is a forum for playful, serious, and radical perspectives on art and culture in the world today. Mm. And and this sort of seems to fit into it to me. It's kind of an art with science thing. Yeah. So, I like when you get that intersection. You know, yeah. as an artist collaborate with scientists, and you get this sort of thing. It's really good. Thanks for that, Hannah. I'll do it for TWIV418, which you can find at iTunes and also microbe.tv slash TWIV. And we love getting your questions and comments. Of course, send them to twiv at microbe.tv. And think about supporting our science shows. You can go to microbe.tv slash contribute. There are a number of ways you can do it. One of them is at Patreon, where you can donate on a monthly basis, anywhere from a dollar up. And I have a new reward to encourage some of you to give a dollar a month. If you do that, we'll get your questions to the top of the queue. Ooh. <laughs> Dollar a month, and you send a question in, we'll answer it on the next TWIV. It's got to be some bonus, right? The other yeah. levels, five and ten and so forth, get mugs and shirts and other sorts of things. But I figure a buck, yeah, you need to get something more than your name on a page. So, And, you know, having your questions answered quickly is very important because sometimes sure. it can be months, <laughs> right? <laughs> right. To do that, so... It's just a buck a month. We'd appreciate your support to let us do things like bringing Alan to ASV next year. Sure. Which he appreciates. Yes, I do. Join us. Well, Dixon de Pommier has left. He's off talking about a vertical farm, but he's right here and uh, at New York City. And you can also find him at his cool website. He's got a couple, but um, uh, parasiteswithoutborders.org is one that's pretty cool. And and there you can find his the sixth edition of his uh, book, parasitic diseases you can either buy it or you can download the pdf for free so that's cool and he's also got uh, the livingriver.org which is very pretty all about stream ecology thank you diction kathy spindler is at the university of michigan at ann arbor michigan thank you kathy thanks this is a lot of fun and it's now getting a little bit dark but it's still not sunset sun's below the horizon here I can see the west, and it's I just see a red glow, and that's it. It's quite dark. It's interesting. Rich Condit is an emeritus professor from the University of Gainesville, <laughs> the University of Florida in Gainesville. He's now in Texas. Thank you, Rich. Sure thing. Always a good time, and we still got light here, but I'm south. I went, when does it get dark there? About 7? Uh, no, not that late. It's uh, actually, I was, uh, I love it. I love it. <laughs> I was getting dark yesterday as I was driving my granddaughter to her ballet class. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, it was just, it was sunset. That's right. And so that was a little before six o'clock and there was a beautiful sunset. And we talked about it in the car on the way. Mm. Doesn't get any better. Than nice. That. That's get any great. Better than did that. you stay for the class or did you leave? You bet. No. <laughs> I. Uh, th- and sometimes when this happens, I go... Um, uh, hang out at Starbucks, uh, but this was a particular night when actually my daughter and her husband were off at a play, uh, and actually it was opening night for one of my daughter's shows, and uh, so uh, it was a special night where they're getting measured for their costumes. It's parents, parents or guardians visiting night. This was actually a musical theater class, and they're getting measured for their costumes. So we sat in the room and watched them do their shtick for half the time. And then for the other half the time, I uh, measured Harper for her costume and ordered her costume. <laughs> it's just, it just doesn't get any better than that. It's just delightful. <laughs> That's great. All right. I love it. <sighs> Alan Dove is at alandove.com. He's also on Twitter. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. And I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I'd like to thank the sponsors of this show, Curiosity Stream and Drobo. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs> <laughs>